From Olympic City and the home of Pikes Peak, this is the Automotive ADHD Show. And here we are rocking it on another great edition of the Automotive ADHD Show. Heard around the world as a podcast and also on the radio in Southern Colorado, 91.7 KLZ, our voice of the Wet Mountain Valley. Matt West here talking cars with you. This, of course, is the correct car show. I have a lot of stuff to talk about this week. We're going to talk about sports car designer Penn and Farina and how they are no longer designing sports cars, but instead smartphone cases, because that's definitely more exciting than sports cars. Um, We're also going to talk about Lewis Hamilton drifting an R34 skyline on the streets of Japan to the chagrin of the Japanese people. Um, nobody in Japan was happy with it, while the rest of us in other parts of the world thought it was fantastic. So we're going to discuss that. Uh, we're also going to touch on a BMW executive and how they have said to stop buying new BMWs. And we're also going to see just exactly how long their employment at BMW lasts, considering that statement. Um, and one other thing, too, we are going to... Um, Talk about why road signs in the United States are green. I know. Don't you just stay up at night tossing and turning, wondering why, why, why are they green? I I wonder the same thing, though I don't have any problem with them being green. I'm just, you know, curious. Why are they green? We're going to answer that question and play your car sounds on this edition of the Automotive ADHD Show. Now, if you love cars... Well, you know where this is going. The RPM Act. If you love cars, you should love the RPM Act. What the RPM Act does is it limits the EPA's authority to infringe on your right to turn streetcars into competition-only track cars. Uh, And if they get their way, they are going to kill off grassroots motorsports. Um, Every form of motorsports practically outside of NASCAR and F1 who have billions and billions of dollars to lobby the government so that they aren't affected. Uh, but you and you and I, the grassroots motorsports enthusiasts, are directly affected by this. And we need to support the RPM Act. Even if you don't race, you need to support the RPM Act because a lot of the companies who make the cool street legal parts you put on your street car um, also make their money predominantly from racing. So, uh, yeah, support the RPM Act. We can fight back. We can prevent the EPA from taking our right to build race cars. Check it out. Saveourracecars.com. If you go there, you can send a letter, a pre-built letter to your state representative. It'll even put you in touch with the right folks. You just put your zip code in, puts you in touch with the folks who need to hear it. Check it out again. Saveourracecars.com. Now, before we get into the uh, first couple of things here on the show, I know it's a later show this week than usual. Uh, had an unexpected family emergency that I had to tend to uh, at the beginning of the week, so uh, I had to get that done first, but nothing at the end of the day could stop me from doing the show, stop me from talking about cars, because you realize if I don't do the show, I just I talk about cars to my friends endlessly, and they eventually get tired of it and tell me to shut up. Yeah, just go do your show. Just go do it there. <laughs> We've heard enough of it, so nothing could keep me off of it for too long. Uh, and of course, all is well now. Uh, but I also hope you had a fantastic Thanksgiving uh, last week, and I hope you ate copious amounts of food in celebration of the fourth gen small block Chevy, which, as we all know, was invented by the Pilgrims way back in 1620 in order to um, cross the ocean and go to uh, North America. So. Uh, that is a uh, a, that is a, a holiday we always celebrate every year, and is a wonderful holiday. And uh, who who doesn't love food and 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 small block Chevys? So there you go. Um, hey, speaking of the fabled fourth gen small block Chevy, you need to check this out. There is a YouTuber by the name of Piston Ranch, and he did something pretty interesting, in my opinion. Now he has a uh, Ford based, it uh, looks kind of like a model a based, um, rat rod and rat rods, of course, 
are a fantastic breed of car with the body from one car stuck onto probably some random frame with a different engine and it's all rusty and it's all hacked together. The roofs are usually chopped and then re-welded on and I, I, they've got huge wide tires. And rat rods are a special breed of car. And this gentleman is uh, no stranger to rat rods. And in his rat rod, he has an LS V8 in it, otherwise known as a fourth gen small block Chevy. Uh, but that being said, he had an LS in it. He said, you know what? Everyone does an LS in these things. That's too normal. I need to be different. I need weird in my life. And um, that's exactly what he did. So he wanted to keep a Ford drivetrain in it for the most part. So he got a Ford. Ford straight six, an old school, old school um, Ford 300, by the way, 300 cubic inch straight six. And those are not necessarily known for making all that much power. So what do you do when you want to make power with it? Well, one way is to get more air into the engine and you can do that through a number of means, but a better, more efficient cylinder head design is one way to do it with bigger valves, uh, bigger intake ports that flow better. That's one way you can do that. So he decided to take the heads from the LS that he already had swapped, the LS V8 that he had swapped into this rat rod. He took the aluminum heads off of it and cut them into pieces and then re-welded them together to make one straight long six cylinder straight six head. So he took basically one bank and cut another one in half and then welded that to it to make a a straight six head, which I think is fantastic because what companies out there make straight six aluminum aftermarket cylinder heads or these Ford 300s? I honestly can't think of any. Now, for the Jeep stuff that I've done in the past uh, with the Jeep straight sixes, I love my uh, 4.6 liter stroker that I built out of a uh, Jeep 4.0 initially. And um, and now I have the factory head, but I've got different valves, uh, different cam, roller rockers, all that stuff. But I was at a time looking at Edelbrock, which makes an aluminum head for that that engine. The aluminum, of course, aluminum, of course, is lighter weight. Uh, the cylinder head designs more efficient. And then I decided that I'm cheap and I would just reuse the factory head and um, get everything set up to run. Also, bigger valves, bigger ports and all of that. So that being said. For this guy's application, he couldn't really do that. And what amazes me is how he was able to, again, cut some LS cylinder heads, weld them together, and make a straight six head. And the fact is, he's welding cast aluminum. Now, bear in mind, I am no fabricator by trade. Um, I, can, I can use a stick welder to make some absolutely grotesque things that you should absolutely not trust your life with. But that's about it. Um... That said, I understand professional fabricators that welding aluminum is a pretty, uh, it's different, but it's a regular thing that many professional fabricators do. But when it comes to welding cast aluminum, that's got to be different, honestly, because I mean, even welding cast iron is something that's typically frowned upon and is not generally a thing that is uh, very successful most of the time. But this guy, I guess, has a technique. He's got the he welded the cast aluminum, presumably then redecked the cylinder head so it was all flat. And amazingly, amazingly, the whole thing works. And I have a sound clip of it here. Check this out. Give this a listen. <laughs> Well, isn't that interesting? That was one of his uh, first startups there. And he's, uh, I'm not exactly sure what he's running for engine management. That's not very clear because if you were using the stock GM ECU for it, uh, he's using uh, stock LS uh, coil packs and some other things too. I'm not sure how you would necessarily make that jive with a, a six cylinder, though. Uh, any any standalone engine management system, even the cheap ones, you know, and, and enthusiast ones, uh, Speedduino, um, Russ EFI, Mega Squirt, those ones, they would. Obviously, I'll do that just well. But, you know, this guy, uh, I'll have to get him on the show at some point because uh, he couldn't he still couldn't leave it there because he slapped a big old turbo turbski on the side of this thing. So turbo straight six Ford 300 with an LS cylinder head. Isn't that weird? See, when you can. Yeah, it's it's fine and all to say, oh, I've got an LS swapped, whatever. You know what? That's that's great. You know, there's nothing wrong with 
typical swaps. And the reason they're typical is because they're cheap, available, and easy to do. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. But when you got to spend five minutes explaining what the hell it is you built and how does it work, um, that's honestly pretty cool. Uh, that's honestly pretty cool to, to those especially who have the patience to listen and understand what it is. Um, that is seriously cool. He says he's only got about 1500 bucks into this thing too, uh, which is fantastic. We need more of this. This is much like the, the very first episode of this show I did. Uh, I talked about a K24 based straight six was a, is a, a Datsun 280Z engine with a K24 based cylinder head. Uh, so it's effectively a six cylinder K24 K series, which is pretty sick when you think about it. Um, and uh, that's pretty cool. But that had all sorts of custom casting and machining that went into the cylinder head. The, the cylinder head wasn't like two K24 heads. Well, welded together like one and a half really you need the four cylinder side and then like two more cylinders right uh it wasn't that it was a custom casting based on that this though the dude literally cut uh, he has a, an ls head and a half and he welded them together and i think that's amazing so um i would love love to see more nonsensical things like this these are exactly the sort of things we need uh in the uh, automotive world to keep things interesting so there you go now hey don't go anywhere we are going to talk about how pen and farina the sports car designer isn't really making sports cars anymore they're they're making smartphone cases yeah we'll talk about that here in just a minute Twas the night before christmas when all through the house not a creature was stirring not even a mouse the children were nestled all snug in their beds while visions of turbos danced in their heads. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from my bed to see what was the matter. When what to my wondering eyes did appear, but a Mark IV Supra with boost to hear. And a little old driver, so lively and quick, I knew in a moment he must be Saint Nick. And then in a twinkling I heard the tires screech, the prancing and pawing of each horsepower. Down the track, St. Nicholas came with a bound. A bundle of parts he had flung on his back. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work and filled all the stockings with speed parts and more, for the children would not have to return the core. He sprang to his Supra with tires to roast, and down the track he went making the most. With 40 pounds of boost on tap, he tore, knowing the children would soon have more. Saying Merry Christmas from the Automotive ADHD Podcast. Ho, oh, oh. ho! Horsepower. All right, here we are rocking it for the second half of the Automotive ADHD show. Yeah, Christmas time. It's already getting to be that time of the year again. Can you believe it? It is now within the first week of December. That's crazy. This year has flown by. But hey, those car sounds were sent in by Cameron. That is his uh, 1999 Pontiac Trans Am. Speaking of LSs with an LS2 and a Stage 3 cam. Also throwing some new bumper music into the work there, uh, into the works there. How, how do you like that? I know, I know. I got to mix it up a little more often. So anyway, I want to thank Cameron for sending those car sounds in. Remember, if you have car sounds and you want to send them in, and you do because you may be compensated for it, uh, when you do, there is a chance to win the Automotive ADHD keychain as well as a $25 parts store gift card and an Automotive ADHD sticker, the As Heard on the Automotive ADHD sticker. So that is very cool. I pick winners, uh, one winner every month from all the car sounds that I get for that. So send those car sounds in facebook.com slash automotive ADHD. You can also email me Matt at throttlewarrior.com. So let's talk Pen and Farina because Pen and Farina is a classic, classic sports car designer. Their roots go all the way back to the 1930s and they've designed many great cars uh, such as the Ferrari 250 GT Lusso, the Ferrari Testarossa, the Fiat 124 Spider, and um, weirdly, the Volvo C70. Yeah, one of those isn't like the others. I can tell you that much. <laughs> but regardless, Pen and Farina is, is famous for decades 
of exotic cars, beautiful car design. Um, they are they are truly a staple of um, European cars. And uh, they did the famous um, Ferrari Modulo concept back in 1970 as well. And so what what's interesting here, speaking of that Modulo concept, um, they made they're now making cell phone cases. Smartphone cases, not sport. Now, granted, they never manufactured sports cars. They were merely the designer. Uh, if you were Ferrari and you wanted a beautiful car, you you told Penn and Farina to to design your beautiful car. That said, um, <laughs> smartphone cases. Now, yeah, you can get. Now, I'm not saying you should. I'm, I'm actually kind of critical of this. We'll talk about my opinion here, but um, you can get. A smartphone case, if you have a uh, iPhone 14 specifically, they're only making the, I guess, the case for the 13s and the 14s. Can you believe it's already like iPhone 14? I, I, I That's nutty to me. But anyway, um, these cell phone cases, which are inspired by Penn and Farina's designs, so-called, quote-unquote, um, <laughs> cost no less. They start, they start at $10,000 one of these smartphone cases and they're not remarkably all that interesting to look at honestly i when you think of pen and farina you think of timeless beautiful lines and the smartphone case well it's it's a, an aluminum rectangle with a little little section of leather right above the the camera cutout for the uh the iphone and you can have them in a couple different colors and one with leather and a wood panel on it and it's a rectangle it's literally like a sandblasted aluminum anodized rectangle so it's a it's a smartphone case exactly that's what it is and um, ten grand also it doesn't exactly invoke thoughts of pen and free it's got a slight ridge to the back a very slight ridge that's supposed to look like the roof line on the Ferrari Modulo concept from 1970 looks I'm not seeing it I don't see Ferrari when I look at this smartphone case um, and not only that can we talk about the price ten thousand dollars. And that's not even the, like, that's the basic one. Like, that's just the simple one. That's where it starts at. And, okay, 10 grand for an aluminum machined smartphone case. There are, okay, but not to mention the fact that there are plenty other ones that exist uh, in the, that fashion um, that are, you know, similar, you know, machined aluminum smartphone cases. Uh, for far less than $10,000, let's talk about the inherent flaw of putting a $1,000 smartphone. If you got an iPhone, it's a, uh, you know, it could be about a thousand bucks, maybe a little bit more, depending on the model. Um, and uh, by the way, I blame all of this on Tim Cook and his horrible F1 flag waving uh, fiasco from a few weeks back. But <laughs> that being said, um, OK, yeah, your iPhone's maybe like a thousand bucks and then you're putting it in a ten thousand dollar smartphone case. Doesn't that sort of defeat the purpose of the smartphone case? Because I get it. This is a car show, but let me let me delve into this because um Right, I've got an iPhone, um, I do, and I have a case on it, and the case, I'm, I'm holding it right here, is is a great invention because the phone itself is fairly delicate, and the case lets me drop it like that, and, and it doesn't hurt the phone. See, I'll do it again. There we go. Um, and uh, that's the whole point. The, the case is there to protect the otherwise expensive smartphone. My smartphone case is pretty bare bones. I think it was like 15 bucks on Amazon, um, and it keeps my phone in one piece when I'm working in the garage, sliding the phone around on greasy, dirty shop tables and accidentally dropping it on the concrete floor. I don't do that very often, but you know what? That's what the case is for is, you know, like $15 case, thousand dollar phone. Um, the problem you have here is the, the case, this case is $10,000. You could buy 10 phones for the price of this case. So then think about this. What really happens when you you think you know okay I've got this ten thousand dollar case ooh I better not scratch it I better not what if I drop it and 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 put a scratch in the case <laughs> that's not the conversation you should be having with yourself and then what's going to end up happening is you're just going to leave the case at home and take the phone without the case because honestly it's just cheaper to break the phone and go through ten phones before you risk damaging your fancy Pen and Farina iPhone case um, so the whole point of this being so expensive it. It's useless. You're not going to use it. There's no point. What is the actual point in having it? For one, it doesn't really look like a Pen and Farina design. I mean, it is, but it doesn't really. I mean, come on, it could be anything. Uh, and for two, 
You're never going to put your phone in it. And for three, how about this? Do you remember when the iPhone came out 14, 2008, 14 years ago? I remember that. And the trend, there was, there were, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily a trend, but you would see, you know, fancy fashion designers with gold iPhones. Whoa, there's this gold. You would, you could send your iPhone to a company who would take the, the back cover off of it and replace it with one that's gold. And now you got one that's special and it's real gold. Ooh, it's a, you know, 24 karat gold iPhone. Well, what is that phone worth now? Aside from the intrinsic value of the gold itself, it's, it's meaningless because no one cares about an old, um, busted up, you know, 10 plus year old iPhone anymore. It's old tech. It's passe. It's, it's gone. Um, so all you have is the value of the metal that it is made out of. Um, and, uh, and that's the problem with spending 10 grand on an iPhone case. Okay. So when Apple makes a new iPhone, and you spent 10 grand on this this phone case and now no one cares about that iPhone those iPhones are being thrown away in a few years you've got this $10,000 phone case that doesn't go to any usable phone like what's the point point? and you do, it's not even made out of gold so you can't even say well it's got the value of the real gold that it's made out of. no it's not even that <laughs> it's the most senseless pointless thing i think you could find um and uh oh and by the way they're saying the case took you know, over two years to develop. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So you suck at designing phone cases. It shouldn't take, I could make this phone case in, I don't know, like AutoCAD in like 10 minutes. And I'm not even good at using that. I, I could, <laughs> I could do that. And uh, you know what? This is one of those weird things that, um, I'm not sure who this is necessarily designed for. Now, granted, if you've got the money, the discretionary income to drop 10 grand on a phone case, you probably aren't all that worried about, you know, dropping it or scratching it or those other things. It's just incredibly strange. I mean, really, who's who is this for? I, I'm not necessarily sure. Uh, and the fact is, for $10,000, um, you could buy 10 Volvo 240s like the one sitting in my garage that's not running. You could buy 10 of those. You could buy you could buy a nice car. Like you could buy a nice used uh Camry, you know, or something like like a nice like <laughs> 10 grand gets you a nice used car. Let's not even beat around the bush with that. That's not like a, a pile of garbage like most of my cars. That is actually a nice used car. Uh, or you could have an iPhone case. Styled by Pen and Farina. But is anyone really going to notice? And then imagine this, you're going to your, you know, you are a, a person of affluence and, and money and you're going to your fancy cocktail party and yes my uh my my cell phone case was designed by pen and farina and everyone's gonna go huh who because unless you're into cars um you may not you may not recognize that name oh yeah they designed ferraris and then people go oh okay as they sip on their wine and eat their caviar and then go do something else <laughs> that's how i picture this playing out so oh man um yeah, d tell me what you would do. Facebook.com slash automotive ADHD. I mean, yeah, it's cool that it was developed by Penn and Farina, but would you buy this? Actually, don't even tell me that because I know you wouldn't buy this. We're, we're, we're smarter than that. We're smarter than that. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I mean, the fact that it exists, you know what? No one's forcing you to buy it. If you want to buy it, I guess you can. That's cool. If you've got a Penn and Farina built Ferrari, maybe you would like to have that or Penn and Farina designed, I should clarify. So, oh, man. I don't know. <laughs> this is one of those weird things. Now, I want to touch on um, on another topic here. Um, let, let's talk about F1 and uh, uh, and specifically about Lewis Hamilton and how he is single handedly enraged the entire Japanese public um, by doing something otherwise kind of neat and fun. So and this is uh, trending on the Internet, on Twitter and a bunch of other places. But Sir Lewis Hamilton, can't forget the sir, of course, is an acclaimed F1 driver. He currently ranks sixth overall in the 2022 F1 standings. He, of course, uh, hails from England and races for Mercedes, uh, and he has an estimated net worth of about $825 million. And the reason I'm mentioning that, that is important. We will touch on that. Um, so he decided the other day to go rent he was uh, he was uh, in Japan visiting in Japan and he decided to go rent a R34 Skyline which is quite an interesting car um, of course if you are familiar with uh, Japanese tuner cars Japanese tuner car culture you know the uh, the the fame and the um, the excitement 
that surrounds the R34 Skyline. I mean, you know, that's obviously, you know, A, not only is it a cool car, a uh, turbo, all aluminum, straight six, dual overhead cam, all wheel drive, sometimes all wheel steering uh, performance coupe. That is that is very cool. There's not many of those out there. Um, but that said, you know, it's also the car, you know, pa- Paul Walker's character in Fast and Furious drove the, it's famous for that as well. So, uh, you know, the R34 is, is undoubtedly very cool. The fact that we can't get them in the United States is also, um, a tragedy. We're, we're getting there. We're getting to, you know, the 25 year rule on them. But, but as of, you know, it, it's always been forbidden fruit. And that's one, that's also perhaps why the R34 Skyline is such a popular car why it's so popular in in mainstream media maybe you know it from gran turismo or maybe fast and furious the fact is we can't get them in the united states so immediately of course we gravitate to anything we can't have that being said hamilton goes out to a japanese rental car company that specializes um in classics and um and 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 supercars and things like that and uh rents an r34 and uh then posts a video on twitter of him driving it around japan and most crucially, doing donuts in a Japanese parking lot. And uh, why is why does that matter? But it matters because he po- posted that to the chagrin of all the Japanese people in the world. Uh, I guess they all hated it. And it, it's, the video is trending. It's got 2.6 million views on Twitter already. Um, and, and, you know, I think a lot of folks are saying, look, it's Lewis Hamilton driving an R34. That is super cool, which that is. Though the Japanese... Um, have a remarkably different opinion, which is that uh, that he is he is almost as bad as the Antichrist. <laughs> um, and uh, I'll, I, I'm going off of the comments here uh, on this Twitter thread, and this was through Google Translate, and I do find it amusing. One Japanese user says, "You are bad mannered driver. As Japanese, I cannot forgive you." <laughs> so that being said, they're saying that he was speeding through traffic, which is never on the video. The video was sped up. Like it was clearly like time lapse. Like, yeah, that was uh, the only thing that was perhaps illegal that he did was a set of donuts. And now that that goes, you know, some say, well, he's you know, it's Lewis Hamilton. You know, just let him go have fun. Let him do what he wants. You know, whatever. He's just having fun in a cool car. And. I understand that part of the argument, but you got to think from the the Japanese people who are all hating on Lewis Hamilton uh, and all hoping that the FIA imposes some kind of ban on him now for for this um, is uh, is you know the, the Japanese have more respect for other people's property. One could admit uh, they tend to respect uh, things in general maybe a little bit more, um, and um, uh, though that's not necessarily reflected by some of the other comments. Uh, well, there was one comment. That was funny on this Twitter thread. Someone posted a picture of a Japanese person posted a picture of ramen noodles in response to his um, donuts, which I don't know if there's some cultural subtext here that I'm necessarily missing. Um, But that's what they did. That being said, okay, so the Japanese are pretty upset with him. The rental company that rented him the car uh, is perhaps allegedly they are at least discussing filing a lawsuit against him. No word if that's actually come to fruition, but um, he okay. So he violated his rental agreement, right? Um, you know, Jeremy Clarkson once famously said that you know, and I'm paraphrasing, but that the fastest car is one that you've rented, uh, and that's true in some cases. Is that necessarily morally correct? Uh, not necessarily. Like if I was renting a car on Turo, for instance, if I was renting a personal vehicle on Turo, I would really appreciate it if someone didn't beat on it, at least in a way that I wouldn't do. However. That being said, a rental company, you know, well, it's a big rental company. Well, when you look at it, like, you know, with their property, you should respect it the same way if it was an actual person. Now, I'm delving into the moral gray area here, which is if it's a rented Toyota Yaris uh, or a Camry for like twenty nine ninety nine a day, I'm probably not going to be all that interested in babying it like a R34 maybe then again if I had an R34 I would I would beat on that that's what that car's for that's what it's for it's a performance car and arguably the only damage that Hamilton did to this vehicle was uh, to the tires of it um probably no mechanical damage was suffered or even mechanical wear and tear was suffered on the vehicle uh from this now again truth be told what you should do I get that Lewis Hamilton's pretty wealthy. He's an acclaimed F1 driver. He has a net worth of 825 million. He's uh, 
He's not hurting for money by any means and probably figures, ah, I'm big and I'm important. I'm going to do whatever I want. And, oh, if I break the rental agreement, who cares? I could buy a, I could buy a hundred of these cars. I don't even care. There's a Toyota Camry as far as he's concerned, um, which that's not necessarily the right way to go about things, especially if you're a wealthy person. I mean, yes, you can technically do that. You have the money to just pay the damages and pay the fines on the rental contract, whatever fines are agreed upon when you sign that, should you violate the contract. Sure, you can do that. What I think here, honestly, what, what I think would be the better way to do this, if you're Lewis Hamilton and you're saying, I'm in Japan and I want to rent a GTR and post a video on social media because uh, everyone will think it's cool and fun, which for the most part it is, um, and what you could do differently if you were Lewis Hamilton is go ahead and say, all right, you know, talking to the rental companies, tell the rental company, hey, I want to, you know, I'm a famous racing driver. I want to do uh, uh, some social media posts with this car and just enjoy it around town while I'm here. Um, would you guys be OK if we did this in the video and or if I threw in an extra promotion for you? Uh, and I'm sure they would be more than happy had he just asked them. Uh, that's the thing. The donuts, maybe that's a stretch because I don't know if, you know, granted, he didn't do the donuts on a public road. He did them in a parking lot. But I, I don't know if that's legal in Japan. I'm not a I'm not a, a, a case traffic lawyer uh, in Japan. I'm not clearly. <laughs> but that being said, hey, look, just ask him, hey, I want to do this with it. and I'm going to post a video and they'll probably say, yeah, sure. That's awesome. Because, A, you as a famous racing driver get to post a neat video that gets millions of view views on social media. And B, they get some free good publicity from it. Um, and then they also have a cool story to tell customers who maybe want to rent that same car in the future. Yeah, this is the one Lewis Hamilton drove. And then they can charge more money for it or something. I mean, that's when you think about it, in the end, that's kind of a win-win. And if you're a celebrity, if you're a prominent public figure, it kind of behooves you to, to actually do things, more things like that. Um, just because you are a, a big celebrity and you have that reach and you you have people who look up to you as a role model, you're in a way sort of obligated to 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 do it well. Uh, and that's not necessarily what Hamilton did, though Hamilton did some pretty precise donuts with this R34. So, uh, yeah, I, again, that's cool. Uh, now, I've been looking through some more of the comments on social media for this. Uh, one person said, let Hamilton, uh, Lewis Hamilton did donuts in your car. Auction it off for a fortune. You could do that. Or this is my favorite comment out of this whole this whole debacle here, which is, quote, a foreigner misbehaving in Japan had better be careful or he could be gone in 60 seconds. Gone spelled as in Carlos Gone, the Nissan executive. Ah, this is this is clever if you know what happened. By the way, if you're unfamiliar, Carlos Ghosn, um was former uh, Nissan CEO, was a former Nissan CEO. Uh, charged with all sorts of uh, white collar crimes, was thrown in Japanese jail, and then he escaped from jail in a in an act probably befitting of a, a movie by hiring like former special forces contractors to break him out of jail, stuff him in a suitcase, and then he rode in that suitcase in an aircraft in an airplane like a commercial airliner to another country that he's now taking asylum in from the <laughs> it is a weird situation i've i've mentioned it briefly before on the show it is an absolutely bonkers situation so that being said i think that comment there be you could be gone in 60 seconds <laughs> that's good that's quality i like that that's what i want to see so um yeah but moral of the story um you know if hamilton asked the rental company hey can we do this this will be really cool. You'll get some promotion out of it. I get to have fun. I think that would be fine. And if he did that, Hamilton would sail off into the night in his rented skyline and probably head off to the, uh, I, I don't know, the nearest maid cafe. Uh, and then everyone is happy. End of story. So <laughs> there you go. What is he What does he do in his free time in Japan? I'm, I'm curious. Actually, you know what? Never mind. I don't want to know. On second thought, on second thought, I'm... Uh, I'm fine uh, not knowing. So anyway, there you go. Now, hey, coming up in the next segment, we are going to talk about road signs. Why are they green? And also how a BMW executive says you should stop buying BMWs. And we'll see how long they're employed. That's coming up right here. Now for how things work with an engineer. Engines. Speed. And that was how things work with an engineer. More of how things work can be found at Facebook.com slash Automotive ADHD. All right.
right. Hey, I told you I was trying out some new bumper music. I am digging it. Hey, those car sounds were sent in by Tanner a couple of weeks ago. That was his uh, Volvo 164 with an LS. Well, I don't know if it was an LS, but it was a V8 in there, and it sounded awesome. So remember to send those car sounds into uh, Facebook.com slash Automotive ADHD. Also, remember, this show is not only on Spotify, Apple, iTunes, uh, Google, Amazon, all of the above. It's also now on YouTube and Rumble. Yeah, look it up. I have the links for the uh, for those channels uh, in the description for this podcast. Uh, and definitely check it out. And if you do check it out, I suggest going through Rumble because Rumble is... Rumble's a little kinder to creators than YouTube is when it comes to monetization and a number of things. So um, when it comes to a number of factors like that, definitely check it out. But both places are good. YouTube and Rumble. Look up Automotive ADHD Podcast. Um, and that's what it is under. So get, definitely go check that out. Now, before we talk about um, why are road signs green in the United States, uh, I got to touch on this. So uh, there is a top level... Uh, BMW executive uh, who said some interesting things and uh, hat tip to Jordan Mulock from uh, the um, from drive.com uh, in Australia, not to be confused with the drive. It's a different website, but um, they reported on this and um, one BMW executive goes by the name of Monica Dernali, who is head of BMW's sustainability team uh, is now encouraging uh, consumers to not buy new BMWs. Nope. Uh, she says, <laughs> and this is amazing. She says, quote, we really need to think about prolonging the life of cars, not having a used car market where you sell cars to each other, but maybe take a car and extend its lifespan. Okay. Now my gut reaction to that is good. Yes. I, I am a prime example of taking a car, um, and extending its lifespan well past what it should be intended for the, the like <laughs> well beyond what the manufacturer ever thought you would do with that car um and uh and i know a lot of you do that as well that's that's one thing we love about cars we love wrenching on cars we love wrenching on old cars old cars can in many ways be albeit slower sometimes uh but it can be a lot of fun and hey if you're doing crazy engine swaps the sky's the limit it could be faster than anything on the road there's no traction control no electric nannies none of that stuff and that's always good um so i support this i i do support the statement that mr nolly uh Dur Durnai, however you pronounce her name i do support that um <laughs> here's where it gets a little weird though um so she says we need new skill sets quote unquote, in the aftermarket to design cars so that the seat can be removed and a fresh seat can be moved in. Then it's a used car that looks like a new car. <laughs> I'm sorry, but what? What? Okay. So she's saying all we need to do to make it more appealing to have used cars be on the road longer is replace the seat. That's like her primary point that she's making here. Uh, uh, so I, I hate to break it to Mrs. BMW executive. But that already exists. Um, it's called taking out the seat and putting a new one in. That's what that's called. There's usually like four bolts, maybe some plastic trim. And if you're really fancy, you got heated seats. So there's a little connector at the bottom and you plug that. <laughs> that's it. Like the, that already exists. She says we need to develop the technology and the skills in the aftermarket to design cars so the seat can be removed. I don't think, has she ever actually, has she ever actually like seen a car like she works for BMW. Perhaps she sees them being built. No, maybe not. No, probably not. I doubt that. Has she ever actually been in a car and looked down and saw, seen the little bolts of the, you know, rails on the seat? No, probably not either. So um, she goes on to say, quote, it can have the same owner who doesn't buy a new car, but we still have a business model as BMW and the whole world uh, or the whole society benefits from that. How do you still have a business model if you're not selling new cars and you're just selling service. I'm not sure how you do. If you're just selling service on older cars, how do you have a sustainable business model? Because you're not manufacturing new cars. You're not selling new cars. And not every owner is going to be taking their used BMW to the BMW dealership where you get abs your wallet gets absolutely cleaned out even on the cheapest repairs. I'm sorry. They're going to be taking their cars to as many BMW owners do they're going to be taking their cars to other independent 
um, European car specific uh, auto mechanics, BMW specific independence, not always the dealer. I mean, if your car's five years old and under and it's used, you're yeah, you're probably going to the dealer still. But uh, I, I I don't know. I think um, I think uh, Miss Dernay uh, is maybe a little while her point is valid. I, I acknowledge her point. I in fact, I appreciate her point. I'll give credit where credit is due. Um, I do think she's a little out of touch with society and also thinking that, yes, all we need for new for used cars to be sold uh, and prolong the lifespan of them is to replace the seat. We need to design them so we can replace the seat, which, again, I, that, I'm sorry, but that that already exists. That's that's well documented that <laughs> anyone can do it with a wrench. I swear. Um, that being said, I appreciate her point. She's a little out of touch. Um I, as many top level executives probably are, I don't know if she necessarily lives in the real world for used cars to be practical. Um, there's a number of maintenance items you need for used cars. And as your used car gets older and older, um, things wear out, especially things that are plastic, especially things that are rubber suspension bushings, vacuum hoses, you have rust, uh, you know, on, on metal components, you have corrosion on the aluminum components. Um, you know, and, and obviously all these things can be mitigated, not avoided, but mitigated through through regular maintenance. But there's a lot of things that go into making a used car still drive like it's a new car. Now, obviously, um, it, she also touches on another point, which is, you know, updating other parts of the interior, like the infotainment system and things like that is important, uh, which I also agree with that. Look, if you're driving a 10 year old car and you got the factory head unit and you want Apple CarPlay, no problem. You can go do it. You can go put an Apple CarPlay capable head unit into the car. Boom. Done. That's a feature that's not available on many new cars. The new, new cars. Think your 2022 model year cars that have touch screens that are so thoroughly integrated into the dashboard. Gone is the double din head unit space that fits every variety of aftermarket radio and touch screen. Uh, gone is that the standardized, the standardized spot for a radio in the standard size with the standard type of attachment points is gone in favor of these integrated screens. And what happens? On, I will admit what happens on these newer cars when those integrated screens uh, are 15 years old, are 20 years old. They are out of date. They don't work with your new smartphone in 2035. They don't work with that. They uh, uh, they're broken. And you can't get parts for them. And you can't just swap in a double din size, standard sized aftermarket head unit. Um, that is a problem. So I acknowledge that uh, when she discusses further that we also need to engineer parts of the interior to be upgraded. She was fixated on the seats substantially. I guess she thinks that every used car buyer is looking specifically at the seats. You know, I, I have a 2012 Tacoma. That's like the only vehicle I have that usually runs on a daily basis. That's the daily uh, it's a 2012. It's 10 years old. The seats are fine. I mean, they're honestly fine. There might be a little bit of wear, but I don't care. It's a 10 year old pickup truck and I use it for pickup truck things. I don't care. Um, so I don't know if she's living in reality here, but her point stands, which is that environmentally speaking, and this has been proven by study after study, it is better to keep an old car on the road. It is less environmentally impactful to keep an old car on the road than buy a new car, say, every two to five years um, because of the production and all the environmental factors that go into the production of that new car. Um, all of those production factors have long since, long since been dealt with by a car that's 10 years old, 15 years old. Or if you want to be really fancy and you drive around a 40-year-old Corolla, good for you. That is fantastic. Um, and honestly, they say, well, but new cars are more efficient. Not that much more efficient. I mean, you know, if you're looking at a commuter car that's efficient uh, fuel-wise compared to another one, um, yeah, there. you know what? I mean, you had Toyotas and, and Hondas in the 80s and 90s still doing 25, 30, 35 maybe even touching 40 MPG. So how much more efficient do you want to get compared to a new car? If anything, new cars are just heavier. The biggest argument for new cars, and I'll acknowledge this argument, is improved safety. Um, improved safety stuff, improved crash uh, survivability, uh, things like that. Uh, and if you care about things like automated braking and lane keep assist, cool. They, those, those have that. I don't care about those things. I don't use those. But that being said, yeah, there's some safety stuff that's different, but... 
overall, when you're looking at cars made from, say, the late 90s and up, the 2000s, even a car that's 10 years old, safety-wise, you're not really going to be terribly different. So, um, yeah, I, I think I agree that it is important to keep old cars on the road more. And overall, the general consensus is that environmentally so. If, if the environment is your concern in this, keeping an old car running, keeping it on the road, even if it's a tiny bit less efficient, is still miles better than just buying a new car every couple of years. Way better. Way better. Uh, and I think that's the way to go. Uh, that's what I think. And I think many folks would agree with me on that. Um, now, Miss Dernay is, uh, okay. Is she going to be employed at BMW for very long? Because she's, <laughs> look, she's talking about, um, you know, not buying new BMWs. She says, don't buy new cars. Don't buy new BMWs. Buy old ones. Is she really going to be working at BMW all that long? I guess time will tell. Time will tell. Oh, man. Oh, man. So, hey, uh, before we wrap up the show, I got one more thing. I was talking about this earlier. Um, highway signs. Many highway signs in most parts of the United States, not all, but many parts of the United States are green. Have you noticed that? Yes, you've seen a road sign. They're, they are typically green with white text uh, and sometimes a white border. And have you ever, ever wondered why? Why are they green? Do you, do you stay up at night uh, unable to sleep wondering this fundamental question of our universe, which is why are the road signs green? Couldn't they be another color? Couldn't they be blue? I have seen blue ones, but what about red and, and, and magenta and, and orange and all these other fantastic colors that exist? Um, so, and it's interesting. I got to give a hat tip here to uh, Ryan Eric King from Jalopnik for finding this and also finding an article specifically from the Arizona State Department of Transportation. The Arizona Department of Transportation was asked a similar question and they replied, and I'm, I'm quoting here, I am directly quoting them. They say, quote, green signs are guide signs and green is considered a cool color, end quote. It's cool. Yeah, it's cool. That's it. <laughs> oh, no, I won't leave it there. They do elaborate. They do elaborate what they mean by that. Not only is a green a fine color, green is of all the colors. I don't dislike green uh, and I don't imagine many people dislike green. It's probably pretty neutral on on your like for green. Um, that being said, they say green in being a cool color is not distracting. And they say generally doesn't support drivers or support surprise, rather surprise drivers uh, when they see it. Uh, but likewise, um, it blends into the environment so that it's not annoying it's not obtrusive. It's not, it's, uh, it doesn't stick out, but it only is noticed when you need it. And they say this goes back to a, a number of studies and some scientific evidence and tests. Uh, what I found fascinating about this is according to the same article from the Arizona Department of Transportation, they say that in Arizona, at least, I don't know if this applies to other states, but in the 1950s and 1960s, um, Arizona had experimented with what I think at least is a brilliant idea, which is colored signs that indicate direction. So, and this is how it works. This is how they had it set up. So if you were going west, the signs would be brown. Your exit signs and your road marker and mile marker signs would be brown. If you were going um, east, uh, if you're going east, they would be orange and if you were going north they would be green and um and so on and so on and so that that's kind of that's kind of interesting um and, and to me that that's like if you were wondering like i will admit being here in colorado it's not very uh it's not it's not hard to know which direction you're heading because we typically understand at least where i live that the big mountain range is to the west and the sun sets to the west so you look where the mountains are, that's generally west. But in, in places like Arizona, like in the desert, with stuff like that, especially if the sun's right up in the sky and you're wondering, which way am I going? You don't have a compass. You don't know, am I traveling northbound or southbound on this road? I've never been here. You would know by the road signs, which I think is kind of cool. I mean, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily complain if we switched to this, though the switch here would come so late now. I mean, drivers for generations have been trained to see typically blue 
uh, or not blue, uh, typically <laughs> green road signs. I was, about, I was mixing up a point there, but I was about to get to the fact that in many countries, the road signs are blue. I've seen a few states that do have blue road signs that indicate different things. Uh, and we're not talking about stop signs and, you know, uh, different things like that. We're talking about general signs, exit signs, road signs, uh, road name signs, things like that. I don't think this would go all that unwelcomed, though. I, it would be kind of neat. It would be so prohibitively expensive to switch to that now. Obviously, this I don't think it would ever happen just because of the cost to switch to it. But imagine, right, if you were in the you know early days of automobile travel and you did this and you started it from the ground up, I don't see why that would be a bad idea. Uh, obviously, an orange road sign might be a little distracting. You might confuse that for some emergency sign, rather. A construction sign. Obviously, we do use orange usually to indicate in, indicate obstacles, construction, uh, things like that now. But regardless, now you know why road signs are green. And that's because the state of Arizona says it is cool. <laughs> that is why. Uh, in reality, yeah, they, they have a point. It's probably It probably boils down to decades of research on what is simultaneously not annoying to look at, not, uh, you know, unsightly, but also still has enough contrast to let you easily read stuff. I know, but I prefer Arizona's description, which is it's cool. And I'm an, I'm just going to stick with that. How about, how about that? I am just going to stick with that answer. Now, when you have friends who ask you who are perhaps also, um, dealing with severe mental turmoil about why are road signs, the color that they are, now you know the answer. And if you live in Europe where none of this applies to you, well, now you know the answer to something even less relevant to you. So, uh, yeah, there you go. How about that? Now, I do want to thank you for uh, listening to this edition of the Automotive ADHD Show. I know, a little later than and a little better late than never, but it's always a good thing. I always appreciate you listening. Keep sending those car sounds in. Remember to check it out uh, on YouTube, Rumble, as well as wherever fine shows and this one are downloaded. Give it a rating on Spotify. Six stars. Let's blow it up. I'll see you right here, same time, same place, next week. <laughs>